when they kept saying, oh, that you're June Osborne, how did you do it? How did you do this? Thank you so much for the flight and for everything. They said it a couple of times and uh, she never said I had help. Ever. Which, ever. <laughs> We're the good doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. And you are exceptionally welcome to our tiny little corner of the internet where today we will be talking about The Handmaid's Tale Season 5, Episode 3, Border. We are so happy that we've had more patrons join us. Oh my gosh, uh, guys. After we giggle every time we get the notification. We're so honored. We share it every time in the Slack. Um... And it's just super exciting for us to uh, be building this community, and we hope you enjoy the Mayday moments. I haven't had a chance yet to check this morning uh, for comments, but um, we are certainly having fun doing them and coming up with them. Um, today's Mayday moment, um, we will be <laughs> sharing some true feelings about Serena um, and talking a bit more about what we touched on in episode two and her... Um, how her cognitive dissonance is emblematic of um, far-right conservative women uh, in this country, and we'll kind of unpack that a little bit more. Uh, so that'll be in our Mayday moment. If you haven't joined our Patreon yet, you still can, and then get this Mayday moment and the Mayday moments for episodes one and two. So very exciting news. Um, all right, let's get into Border. We get a lot in this episode, Again, Chris and I just said offline, uh, I don't know why these episodes are good. I don't know what changed between season four and season five. Looks like the same people are involved in the show that they were before. But we find ourselves both, um, like, positively confused you know, as you were talking and as we were hitting record, I realized that, like, a big part of it for me is that we always knew Fred had to die. Like, at yeah. some point of it. Like, we always knew Fred had to die or Fred had... So, like, as soon as they've killed Fred now, now we don't, like... Like, he was never going to win. Like, you don't build yeah. an entire show and he's going to win. So he was always... Like, something always had to happen to him. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if Serena lives or dies and gets out of this. I don't yeah. have, like, there, I guess, like, the element of mystery is back, too. Like, I never quite know where they're going, um, which yeah. so much of seasons three and four felt really telegraphed. Like, oh, I know what you're doing, and you're just taking forever to get there, and there's so many close-ups. Like, it just felt like a different, the, it really does feel like with the death of Fred Waterford, like, everything's back on the table again. And yeah. It is like, okay, this is as this is almost as intriguing to me as season one was. Yeah. And like also, like, I never loved Emily as a character because Alexa Bladell as a as a performer drives me insane. So I don't miss her. Yeah. Um, like it's one less person to care about. <laughs> yeah. And like the the people that are still around, like the only one who truly confuses me, and I'm like, I literally have no idea what you're do any of you are doing with him is Mark. The rest of them, I feel like they, un like, I, d I still disagree with some of the choices they have June making, but it yeah. tracks with how they've built June. Yeah. He doesn't seem to track with how they've built him, so we're missing key pieces of information we about are him. Missing. Yeah, we are. But other than that, like, I mean, Anne Dowd, this was her Emmy reel, man. Like, oh, she was so good, y'all. Yeah, so we have... So much to unpack in this episode. Really top level acting, actually telling us things that we've wanted to know, like a little bit more about Mayday. Y'all, how yes. long have we waited? 
um, conspiracy theorists out there um, on our Patreon and on conspiracy our Conspiracy cop. <laughs> um, as they were talking about arsenic, I was like, oh, is that... Oh, is that how Esther got the poison? We've got so many questions. Yeah, I was like, what? Like, I was like, I think, I think, it, um, I don't remember who raised the question, but I know Venus was thinking it too. So like, yeah, I'm wondering now if they sewed it into a curtain and that's how, like, how is, uh, I would make sense if there was someone, uh, involved in Mayday at the Red Center. I think there's someone involved in Mayday pretty much everywhere. So like, maybe they were able to get to Esther, but how did Esther know? We have so many questions. Will we get answers? We don't know. Let's get into border. Um, we will, I guess, talk about things as they happen because they kind of. I don't know that we need to break things up by person. No, because um, no, it, it, was... it it flowed really well. Yeah. All right. So we start. We open with. Uh, <laughs> we're back in Canada. Um, with June immediately after the broadcast from Gilead, um, and June is obsessed with the color Hannah was wearing, which we've talked so many times about, like, the colors <laughs> that the women have to wear in Gilead, especially. They're very symbolic. And so this was a new color. She was in, like, a purple, like a lavender. She was not in the pink of children. What does it all mean? And Luke being, you know, none the wiser to anything in Gilead is like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. And her and Moira are like, what was the color? What was the color? And Um, me, like, biblical interpreter over here, is like, okay, well, it means royalty or majesty. So, like, these kids are being set apart somehow. So I wonder mm -hmm. if it's the high commander's daughters. Um, So that was, that's the connection I immediately thought of. But we, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, confirmed at the beginning of the episode. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, June immediately decides Nick will have the answer and Nick will tell me and I can find Nick because I'm June Osborne. And And I have the magic Subaru. And I have the magic Subaru. And you know what, folks? She is June Osborne and she has the magic Subaru and she found Nick by the end of the episode via telephone. Um, But Moira decides to tell her about the group of women at the border, which suspiciously Moira doesn't know that they're Mayday, but like, like, why wouldn't she? But uh, that's by the by. That's a detail that doesn't necessarily need to be focused on. But they decide to get in contact with said group. Um, so let's talk about the group that we find out is eventually Mayday. Um, I think it was hilarious <laughs> that Moira was like, they're a bunch of traumatized refugees and they're the last people you need to be around right now. <laughs> was that? Yes, but I like also yeah. June's totally right. That's not Moira's decision to make. Like, yeah. yeah, you know, it was it was one of those good best friend moments where like the one best friend is like, I will protect you at all costs, and the other friend is like, I never asked you to do that. I didn't like, ask you to do that. Yeah. We have to figure out what's happening uh, to my daughter who was just yep. broadcast on international television. Um, yeah, so they get in the magic Subaru, which knows no bounds and knows no borders. They have a, sh- a shady truck stop meeting, which was perfect. Um, and, you know, we still see this myth of June Osborne. Like, oh, you did the flight. Oh, I was one of the... And the woman they meet was one of the people that June traded for Fred Waterford. Um, I mean, June wanted to save people, for sure. But we all know June's number one motivation was killing Fred Waterford. Yeah. Um, the fact that she got to save people gravy yeah uh, gold star gold star bonus gold star bonus um and i said to to dr Kristen before we started filming the only thing that pissed me off about this episode was when they kept saying oh that you're june osborne how did you do it how did you do this thank you so much for the flight and for everything they said it a couple of times and uh she never said i had help ever which ever like, not I was lucky. When she said I was lucky, I was like, no, no, no. What you should have said was, I had help. How did you do it, June? I had help. I had so much help. I didn't know what I was doing. I tagged myself onto Mayday to get all that stuff organized and forced myself in and forced my idea of the flight on them and put a lot of people at risk and a lot of handmaids died. Do we remember the shootout at the airport? Do we? So, um, that was the only thing where I was like, uh, I'm going to give you trauma brain June and let you go. But you know what? I'm not happy about it. 
Um, so they go to the border, which is close to no man's land. Again, Brenda um, on the Patreon uh, pointing out how the Magic Subaru knows no knows no bounds and how Canada has apparently shrunk because Toronto is not that close to the border um, as as they make it seem. But you know what? We don't have time for those kinds of details, kids. We've got a story to tell. Um, and they find this camp. And they, this is where we get the revelation that it was Mayday, uh, which I actually loved. And I loved yeah. their description of it, that yep. it's just small outposts. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it's a family member. Like, it's just this tiny network of people trying to undermine Gilead however they can and like that's what a resistance movement is they were never going to have like one headquarters that was locatable because that's just dumb and these people are a lot of things and dumb is not one of them nope um and it was beautiful to give June that moment I think of confirmation and when she said like we thought we thought we made it up we thought we made it up to survive yeah, I thought that was a really perfect... Like, I couldn't quite figure out what her face was doing before mm-hmm. she said that out loud. Yeah. But I thought that was perfect. A good reminder that that is absolutely something that traumatized people do. Um, you know, and, and we talked about this, I know, when it happened, either online or offline, so forgive me if this isn't recorded. But I remember when they were talking about Mayday a lot, we kind of uh, likened it to Sam and Frodo talking about strawberries on the, like, the the ride up to Mordor. Like, yeah. sometimes you just have to do that kind of stuff, or your brain will actually fracture. Right, um, you have to believe that you're not alone. And believe that this isn't the only possible reality. Um, yeah. So I was, I was thrilled to kind of get that self-reflection from her. Um, mm-hmm. And I, because anytime you can be reflective about your traumatic experience, it's a step closer to healing. Yeah. Um, because it means you're actually confronting at least pieces of it. And I do, I will say overall in this episode, I see June continuing to find herself again. Um, yeah throughout this which is really um I mean maybe it's the winter gardening I don't know but um I I, this is a much more grounded performance than season four was for me um yeah I think seasons four and three felt really manic yeah and maybe they were supposed to um to kind of portray the level of June's trauma um and to show us all the sides of Dark June, as the vul- as Vulture calls her. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a really lovely moment. It's nice to be reminded um, of all these people kind of working to take down Gilead and like the poster board with the people that they've saved and the, the board of the people that they've lost. And like, it, you know, it's hard not to think about this season as moving towards the end now that we know that the end is coming. Um, Like, we can't unknow that they announced right before season five that season six will be the last season. Um, So it's hard not to see it through that lens, but it definitely feels like, yeah, Fred's murder was the turning point towards the end. Yeah, and I'm fine with it. I don't actually think it's, like, it's hard not to. Like, I, I... I don't know. We've said this before. We love bounded stories. It's one of the reasons yeah. that we like British TV better than American. So yeah. I like knowing right now that if they're doing something absolutely bananas, they know they have eight more episodes to clean it up. Right. Um, right. And, and so I, think, I appreciate that. Yeah. And I think what our criticisms of especially season three and four was that it felt unbounded. Yeah. It felt like and they were we, spinning wheels a lot. We were like, how many seasons are you going to do this? Yeah. Like, you have to move towards something. And, like, we thought they were moving towards things and they didn't. Like, we thought they were moving towards something serious happening to June at the end of season three. And then she survives eight hours from a stomach wound in the forest. Oh, the and the milk uh, truck. Oh, my gosh. The milk truck. Yeah. The like milk the truck best... is, like, my personal lost polar bear. Like, like I just, I'll never get over the milk truck. <laughs> With a festering stomach wound. It's fine. It's fine. Um, So at the Mayday Outpost, we also um, learn that they are sewing things into 
packages and clothes and curtains and whatever they can. Um, and they're, uh, this is part of May Day's operation, working in these small little ways. I love, I love tiny moments of resistance, especially because you have to. Like, they can't just, yeah. like, storm the castle. Um, like they do in The Princess Bride. Uh, this, this has to be a, a, a brick by brick operation. And so, you know, sewing arsenic into a curtain to kill a commander in DC. Beautiful. I have to do it. Yeah. Love it. As soon as they said arsenic, I was like, is that the poison that <laughs> Janine and Esther had? How did Esther get it? How does Esther know about Mayday? So many questions. We better get answers, y'all. Um, and then an interesting moment. I'll be curious what you thought of it. Um, there's there's a, a, a kerfuffle at the outpost, and it turns out that there is an eye um, who has shown up at the outpost. And no, I, he there's some confusion. He doesn't know the code words. And then this wee girl steps out, knows the code word, and is, like, rescued. And it was clear that they had formed a friendship, um, and he wanted to rescue her from Gilead. And then he turns to leave and June says, like, where are you going? And he said, I can't leave my wife and kid behind. And June has a look on her face. And I'm not sure why they gave us that scene. Uh, I was wondering what, what you thought of her look and if they were trying to tell us something or if I'm reading too much into too many things. Well, I mean, I don't know. My impression of the scene, I don't know the answer if you're reading too much or not, but my impression was that sometimes June forgets that Gilead is bigger than the Waterfords. Um, uh. And that that there is such a master network of good people, too, that there it's not just as as much as as much as we really criticize Gilead for seeing things in black and white. Part of trauma brain is that you see things entirely in black and white. And the more that June can understand shades of gray, the, both she, her brain is able to because it's healing and it will continue to let her brain heal. So, yeah. I mean, I don't think because we, you know, we later, we know that at this point in her life, June does not know that Nick is married. Um, but so I don't know if it were also possibly reminded her of Nick. Um, would Nick have gone back for her? If they had gotten married and they had Nicole, you know, there could have been a lot of things. Um, but I think that my immediate reaction was, oh, she's reminded that everybody in the system does not believe in the system. Yeah, I I like that explanation and I'll stick with it. Okay. Um, closing out the our time at the Mayday outpost, um, June eventually gets her phone call with Nick Um and you know what? Those two kids are just always going to love each other. And I don't know if it's this season, but I'm okay with it. We got some weird scenes with them in season four. They both have like narrative Teflon, whatever. It was nice to see them. Um, he's able to tell her that Hannah's safe. She gets to ask him the burning question about the purple color. And we learn that she's moving to a new school um, and sh- that is the color for high commander's daughters who are training to be wives. Which is yeah. particularly revealing as well, because we learn in this episode, we'll go back to it when we spend some time in Gilead, that Nick's wife, Rose, uh, is a high commander's daughter. Um, who is now his wife. Uh, so, <laughs> June, like... June being June is like, Nick, you can just upright your whole life and move to the district that Hannah's in to watch out for her, right? Right? Because you love me, right? (sighs) Child. Um, Which was the perfect opening for him to say, like, I can't. I'm married. Um, Also, you know how things are here? Like, that was a good reminder. (laughs) Yeah. Child. No, baby girl. No. Honey, everyone knows about the two of you. So if he asked for... A transfer specifically to Hannah's district, child. Like, it was pure desperation, and she, she, uh, I was happy that she didn't, like, stick with it and keep pushing and, like, yell at him. Yeah. I could have seen past versions of June where she was like, you don't love me, screw you, and hang up the phone. Um, but she got her way around to it. Um, he gets, she gets to tell him that Nicole is good, uh, 
he gets to warn her about the Mackenzies, which we'll get more to in a minute, I think is going to be a big part of the last two seasons, uh, especially since they didn't cast a no-name uh, as Commander McKenzie. Uh, and then she says, hey, Nick, try and be happy, okay? And he flashes back to them making out and then hangs up the phone. So take in from his, that what you will. In his empty house. <laughs> Oh, June. God love you. Was the right thing to say. Will these two love lovesick kiddos ever see each other again? We don't know. Um, but Especially because now they have to set things up for the Testaments. Or do they? Like, I don't know what the relationship is with the Testaments. So it's going to be fascinating. Anyway. But they, but they are. I mean, they, that's in the press release about season six being the final season. They said, though, we'll transition into releasing the Testaments whatever version of the testaments we're yeah we're gonna, we're gonna get who knows we're gonna get we don't know how they're gonna square those circles but that's a problem i guess for the show writers and not for yeah, us. not for us <laughs> so speaking of gilead uh let's let's go to gilead shall we oh my um, gosh let us this journey. one we're gonna be a little bit brief here because we are gonna save a lot of our serena commentary um, again for the May Day moment. So we're, this is going to be pretty blow by blow. Don't think that we didn't watch with uh, fascination and detailed thinking, but it's all going to be in the May Day moment. It is a lot, yes, a lot of it will be. So um, we end up, we, in Gilead, we are with Serena, who is still there for the time being. And the leadership is so grateful that she put on such a big show. That is what Mark tells her, Mark Twello. Um, the American Canadian a- ambiguous government guy. Maybe we should okay. just call him that way. Ambiguous government guy. Apparently he is an American. Maybe we called him hot Canadian and then we found out he was an American. I'm confused. D- thanks to our beloved friend Nadine Thornhill for having a better memory than the two of us who details of this show uh, go through our brains as if they were made of Swiss cheese. So, Frequently, yeah. We are so grateful for our wonderful community of folks who remind us of details of things that have happened. Um, so, yeah, we, I'm just going to call him White Knight because that's what Vulture calls him. And I think especially in this episode with still like super strong White Knight yeah, vibes, vibes, man. Yeah. Super strong. Um, I'm not even going to get into that whole scene because it was weird and we're going to talk about it in the Mayday moment. Um, <laughs> again... Uh, Bradley Whitford gets all the best lines in this entire episode and so far in this entire season. and He is delivering them with such Bradley Whitford energy. It brings me joy. I laughed so hard in this episode I cried at the stuff that came out of his mouth. Love it. Um, but they show, they show up to Lawrence's house for, for a chit-chat uh, for a dinner. And this is where we meet Commander McKenzie for the first time. We double-checked on the... <laughs> Handmaid's wiki before we started this. Um, we have met um, Mrs. McKenzie before because she helped arrange uh, meets with Hannah for June when June was pregnant with Nicole, I think. Um, and it, for me, his his face was recognizable as an actor. He's been in lots of things, most recently uh, two seasons in Ozark. So, you know, it's again, it's like McC- casting McKenna Grace as Esther. Like, they're not just going to... Like, it's not nameless, faceless actor. Yeah. Um, and I think clearly in this episode, they set up that the Mackenzies are going to be, especially now that we know Serena's not going to be in Gilead, um, the Mackenzies are, are going to be gunning for June, I think. Um, yeah. He knows that June was involved in killing Fred. He believes the Americans helped her. Lol, JK. Awkward for Nick, <laughs> who was at that dinner, to be like, eh. It was me. It was me. Um, and I know Lawrence, all the things like, not Bert. being like not yeah. being said in that room could have sunk a ship. Like, oh. oh, that dinner was so tense and it was juicy. And like Nick was uncomfortable and he was sad about June and Serena ha- was conflicted and Lawrence was just like whiskey. Yeah, he was like unflappable, unflappable. That man. Um, we learn a little bit more about Nick and Rose. They met a few months ago in D.C. Um, and it's clear that Rose has a relationship with the Mackenzies. We learn that they're like very close family friends. Um, so I'm glad we got a little bit more information about that. Um, uh, Nick and Serena have some weird looks about Nicole. Uh, Sure. I don't know emotionally what that woman is going 
through, but we will talk about it in the Mayday moment. Um, also in Gilead, um, well, well, let's finish. We'll finish up Lawrence and Serena, and then we'll do Janine before we close out the episode. Um, we, I'm just glad we didn't get this weird marriage between Serena and Waterford. It made me super, super creepy. Uh, you mean Lawrence, yeah. Lawrence, um, yeah, sorry, Lawrence. Yeah, I, super creepy. I, super creeped out. I couldn't have, I don't think, borne that. Um, and I'm finding it fascinating though that they did make a really big deal that you can't not be married and be in leadership and he's yeah. not wearing the like thingy everyone else is wearing. Yeah. Um, and so that, that has to resolve somehow, but thank you for not resolving with Serena because that would have been, nope, that's a no from me. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and, uh. This is at the dinner table is where we get this fascinating uh, showdown. I wrote I wrote in my notes going on between the people trying to have June killed, the people trying to keep her alive, and whatever the hell J- June decides she has to do. <laughs> so like, and honestly, like, <laughs> and Lawrence, who we don't know actually what we, he wants. We don't know what he's doing. Uh, no. He he helped June with Waterford. He helped Serena with the big. Uh, production the big show we don't know we don't know where lawrence is yeah and then there's the lawrence in it and the june who's always unpredictable um but boy that's that was a little uh upsetting um we get uh commander um mackenzie shows up who when uh, when twello and twello and and nick are having a little tete-a-tete and Ooh, Mackenzie is too smart for all of this, y'all. All of this. Um, he ooh, he creeps me out. Yep. Um, but he like breaks them up real quick and then accuses Nick of a political marriage and threatens him. <laughs> and I think understanding the fact that uh, Rose is a high commander's daughter would explain why she was allowed to live with her disability and yes. why she wasn't like sent to the colonies. Yep. Um, Because we know they make exceptions for, you know, um, we get that line later from uh, uh, Twello. Twello. I know, I love it. About the stunning level of hypocrisy as emblematic in the fact that Rose is not uh, in the colonies or dead for her disability. Um, Yeah, and then we get the weird conversation between Serena and Lawrence. Thankfully, that goes nowhere, but it just... Ooh, I don't know. Um, we're skipping all of White Knight and Serena because we have a lot of thoughts and feelings on it, but we do get the fantastic line that uh, he says about uh, Gilead that it is surface level beauty doing its best to paper over a stunning level of hypocrisy. <laughs> Chef's kiss. That was a beautiful line. Great job, writers. That was perfect. I- and she was like, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I was like, um, Somebody went okay. to the Rachel Hollis School of Therapy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was terrible. Oh, Lord. Oh, I'm okay. sorry you can't see the good that we've been able to do. And I was like, the good you've been able to do. Good we've been able to do. Got it. Got it. Okay, Got it. cool, Serena. You just keep doing you, boo. You just keep doing you. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so to wrap wrap things up with, uh, Serena, sh- she gets called into High Commander's Council. I don't know what she thought was going to go down there, but I think she thought positively about it until Lawrence apologized to her right before she went in. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to hold my glee um, from this moment. Um, but I don't want to not talk about it, even though we're going to go in depth in the Mayday moment. Um, Serena is told she's being sent back to Toronto to be an unofficial uh, quote unquote, global ambassador of sorts. Yeah. My favorite, (laughs) my favorite part about this was it is so, it's such like, it is such conservative fundamentalist Protestant energy of the, like, we have given your future a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your benevolence. People who have no say over my life. Um, and then an unofficial ambassador is like every time they look at a woman who says that she wants to be a pastor and they're like, well, you can be a children's pastor. 
yeah, where you can you, you can teach women and children. You can't like lead a church. It was yeah. the exact same energy, and you can, it was you can oh. be the choir director. Yeah, you know what we yeah. we have it. I mean, some churches they can't even do that because that means they're yeah. over men. Oh. Yes, yeah, so they can only be a children's pastor, and they or like you can be in charge of the kitchen, Serena. That's what we're gonna give you. Yeah, it was one hundred percent like. Would you like to bake tray bakes? Yeah, thank you. I just I like all I applauded at the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and we get perhaps one of the best lines the show has ever given us. Oh my god! Um, I, I believe. I believe in my heart of hearts. It is one of the best written lines the show has ever done. When uh, she looks ready to protest, why she thinks she can protest anything is by the by. Um, and Lauren says, "You are an unusual woman, Serena, and we don't have the proper infrastructure for unusual women to live within our borders." That's it. Like that's the show, man. Like mic drop. Get like that's the back. show, babe. You you have no agency in the system you created. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. I felt as much as I hate Gilead, that moment made me so joyful. Um because I think Serena's pretty horrible and I didn't want her to get what she wanted. Um Yeah, in the previews for episode four, June's yeah. like that woman always gets what she wants, and I was like, oh, but she didn't. But this she didn't, time this she time. didn't. This time she didn't. Um, and she is, yeah, we'll get into Serena in the mating moment. Um, sh- but boy, did that feel good. Did y'all feel good? We felt good about it. I was like doing a dance and she ends up on the same plane with Twello. And that was hilarious. I loved it. <laughs> so I loved awkward. It. She was so grumpy. Um, but she ends up back in Canada and shocking no one, June and the Magic Subaru um, also know she's back in Canada immediately or that she's coming back to Canada. Thanks, Mayday, for that hot tip. Um, and after June and Moira decide they are going to somehow keep Sa- Hannah safe and f- not allow her to be a wife. Who- I mean, that was just so much like they have no power to make that statement. But like Moira, yeah. I mean, like we say like, that kind of thing sometimes, too. Like, yeah. that's not going to yeah. happen. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, we oh, have no power happen. over that. Yeah. I was like, cool. How are you going to do that? We don't care. We don't care. Um, we don't care. Um, but June being June um, gets to the airport, gets past security, whatever security there is, and uh, stops Serena's car and uh, pounds on the glass and says, never touch my daughter again. I liked that moment. I liked that moment so much. Uh, as, the, mu- as much as I, like, I've just accepted the fact that June can go wherever she wants and, and do whatever she wants. In yeah, the once show you give without... in to the deity of June, it makes the show easier to watch. And, like, uh, obsessing over details like time. Yeah, we don't have that. How long it takes to travel information. Yeah. How yeah. quickly they get information. I've no idea the time. Why span. wouldn't Serena, a high class political prisoner, have an escort, an armed escort, to make sure that that an kind of thing armed, couldn't happen? An armed escort to get her back to the ICC detention center, and all she yeah. has is a driver. Sure, sure. Whatever. Okay, show whatever you want to do. Show. Never mind the fact that like. My mother, who was a nurse for her entire life, took one look at Janine and was like, oh, so it's been, like, weeks since they were poisoned because there's no way she would look that well. It was the next day. It was the next day, Mom. It was the next day. Yeah, I was like, okay, makeup artists, we could have gotten, we could have done a Google on that one. <laughs> yeah, so, but I think now I've just accepted five seasons in. Yeah, they don't, they don't, there are things they do not care about and things they deeply care about. Yep. That discontinuity is always going to be there. Yeah. Um, so that we can have moments like June miraculously showing up right as Serena is leaving with no security to be able to pound on her window and threaten her. But I liked it. I was here for it. It was a good way to end the episode. A lot of beauty um, papering over a stunning amount of uh, a, la- a stunning amount of a lack of continuity. <laughs> Could be said about the show. Um, but speaking of Janine and Lydia, let's uh, <sighs> deal with that because I know you have some Lydia thoughts before um, Lydia thoughts. before we close out episode three. So yeah, too long didn't read. Um, both both Janine and Esther survive. They're in the hospital, and Lydia is there. Um, 
we don't get much with Esther except Lydia is furious and slaps the S-H-I-T out of her face and then leaves. And then... At one it's point, mostly... when she was going over to the medicine cabinet, I thought she was going to get somebody to kill her. I thought she was going to kill her, too. I think she thought about it. Yeah, I think she did. That It's like she walked over, looked at the morphine or something, and thought she could overdose her, or and then yeah. just settled on slapping the crap out of her. But, oof. Yeah. Oof. Um, Lydia was, like, not well, y'all. We have... I, and, like, Aunt Dowd is a fantastic actress. We've always said so. Um, she's fantastic in literally everything she touches. I don't think we've seen that facial expression from her before no. as Lydia, and that's the genius of Anne Dowd, is that she she kept that back. Yep. We've yeah. never seen Lydia look like that. Absolutely destroyed at the yep. idea of losing Janine. Her daughter. And like, her functional daughter. Her functional daughter. And blaming herself for it as well. Oh my gosh. Uh, and bargaining with God. Um, and you know, we say a lot of things about a lot of characters on this show. Lydia is a true believer. She yeah. always has been. Yep. And I think she, she, she honestly did always think she was doing the best thing for her girls. Yep. Yep. You can agree or disagree with her, but that is 100% what she believed. Uh, what did you want to say about Janine? Not Janine, Lydia, sorry. I just wanted to bring up, and I don't know if we've ever said it on the channel, but, like, Lydia is a very intentional name, in the same way that the Marthas are an intentional name. Lydia, in the Bible, is in the New Testament, and she is the first acknowledged believer in Christ in the city of Philippi. Um, and Philippi is a big piece of the New Testament. There's a book to the Philippians, the people of Philippi. Um, and so Lydia was the first believer, the first convert. Mm. And if I think about that and I think about, you know, Aunt Lydia being the first convert to Gilead, um, and a quick reminder as you know, she's kind of the, we get, we learn a lot more about supposedly her in the Testaments and she was not the first convert then, but they very much have written her in the show. Like she is the first convert, um, and so I'm really, she's the character I'm the most interested to see how, how they kind of tie the, sh I mean, the book is fundamentally about Lydia and Nicole and, I mean, Lydia, sorry, Lydia and uh, Hannah primarily. Like that's the mm -hmm. two polarities. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be really, I'm most interested to see what they do with Lydia um, and how they kind of weave what goes on and, and, and how that happens. Because like Lydia is praised by Paul in the book of Philippi in the book of Philippians, sorry, for being a faithful member of the church in Philippi. Yeah. And she's one of the, one of the few women named by name in the New Testament. Ooh. And so, like, it is, there's always, there's more than you think there are, but there's not, like, you know, yeah, a no, ton. Not a, I knew there weren't a lot, yeah. But, like, she's named by name. Um, and there's, like, I've certainly sat through conferences where someone said it's most, it's possible she wrote a book that was then rejected from the council um, to put together the, the 66 books of the canonical scriptures. But she was wealthy enough and known enough and learned enough that it's possible she wrote her own epistle um, as she kind of traveled through. So anyway, I wanted to kind of bring that up to remind everybody, again, to emphasize the show is also setting up Lydia as a true believer and as mm -hmm. one of the first members of Gilead. And I, I, there's a lot, you know, I don't, I know we've seen Lydia flashbacks. I'm having trouble remembering exactly what happened in them. But Anne Dowd has always played that Lydia was a mothering figure. Yeah, and she, somebody, was a, yeah. she was a teacher and there was a, a romantic relationship with someone that failed. We got bits of that. Yeah. Um, but she was a teacher. So she was always like a caretaker. Yeah. Um, which is different from the Lydia and the Testaments, who was, yeah. I think, a, a high court judge, wasn't yeah. she? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, so, again, we'll see what they do. That's, I don't think, dude, you've ever brought up Lydia's name before that I can okay. recall. Um, so that was really cool. <laughs> it makes so much sense. Um, the story that you just told about the biblical Lydia. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about... Uh, our Janine in this episode was the arrival of Miss Putnam with Agatha or with Angela. And like, y'all, I was deeply moved by that. I, I thought, 
I really appreciated the moment, you know, in last episode where Mrs. Putnam looked at her and said, and I, I'm always thankful for the people that gave her to me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Mrs. Putnam has always hit me as not a true believer at all. Um, yeah. But like a political, she just wanted a kid and wanted her life. And I think I, I feel like I've always felt like I know a lot more women like Mrs. Putnam than I know, mm-hmm. like, um, uh, Yvonne Strahovski. Serena. Thank you. Why that? I could go Yvonne Strahovski, but not Serena Joy. Sure, brain. Good morning. Hi, Um, it's Friday. It's Friday. Um, I've known so many more Mrs. Putnams in my life. Yeah, yeah. And she's always been very sympathetic to me in that way where, like, you know, she's cutting when she has to be. She's essentially, you know, a real housewife of Gilead. But, like, fundamentally, she just really wants a simple life in a certain way. She wants to be very comfortable and she wants to be a mom. Um, Yeah, and she knows her husband is a Cretan. Uh, who, uh, like, sexually seduces and falls in love with his handmaids. And, like... And she has to deal with that, but her joy is Angela, and so as long as she has Angela, and I think she came to a real good place with Janine, where if the system had been different and it was an open adoption, they could have had a very good relationship, because I think she genuinely wants what's best for Angela, which would have been a relationship with her birth mother. Yeah, and I think... Possibly. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to know who Mrs. Putnam would have been outside of Gilead, but yeah. I, I agree with you. And I think, like, it, you know, this is kind of where we come in as empathy educators, right? Like, uh, a lot of things about Gilead are black and white, but the humans in Gilead aren't. Especially and the women. Especially, especially the women. Especially the women. Especially the women, because there's so much we don't know about them. Yeah. Um, and they have to hide their true feelings so much yeah. about Gilead in order to survive that we don't really know how many of them are true believers. Um, and I think you're right. I think Mrs. Putnam is at times shallow and uh, certainly politically minded. Um, and there were times when she was horrible to Janine. But I think they Absolutely. both evolved into a relationship. Yeah. Where she could have refused Lydia. Well, I guess she said like she couldn't refuse Lydia. Um but, but like she's she's Commander Putnam's wife. She could have refused Lydia. I think so. <clears throat> I think she just wanted to say that to cover her own emotions about it. But when she got to the core of it, it was kind of for of her to say, "I'll make sure Angela grows up to know where she got her beautiful smile and her kind know, nature, and her kind nature, and you won't be forgotten." Yeah, I thought that was very human. And I thought this was a great episode to remind us that there are humans in Gilead. And it's complicated. You have yep. eyes who have families, but also help young girls yep. escape. Like, you have Mrs. Putnam, whom we don't know a lot about internally, but is clearly a complicated human capable of compassion. Revolutions you know? are never the, the moment that is flashy that is covered on the news. Revolutions yes. are always these tiny, as you have said, your favorite is tiny acts of resistance. Mm-hmm. But revolutions are always undergirded. Those flashy moments we're seeing, as we record right now, we're seeing a beautiful, you know, revolt in Iran. Who knows if it leads to a revolution? But yeah. that did not come out of nowhere and not without a whole lot of tiny, res- like, moments of resistance and a lot of black and a lot of graying of people's lives and opinions and experiences. Mm-hmm. In a system that is determined to be black and white and humans are not. And so we're seeing that in Iran, it would be beautiful. And I I have to believe that we will see that in Gilead or why the hell have I watched six episodes, six seasons of this show? Um, Please, please. I just beg. We implore you. I implore (laughs) you. Um, Why have I watched six seasons of this show? But yeah. um, It. It's a it's a great reminder that love is resistance, kindness yeah. is resistance, Compassion. patience is resistance. In the face of a system that denies people's humanity, acts of humanity are resistance. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've said this from the beginning, and I think maybe if we're, you know, forecasting um, the rest of this season... Uh, June's uh, insistence in the necessity of big acts Mm -hmm. 
mm. was always kind of a problem for us because we knew like you weren't just gonna like firebomb Gilead. Yeah. Um they've had really big acts. They've had the suicide bomb in the Capitol. They've had the flight. They've, they've had, had Chicago. They've had yeah Chicago. Like there's been lots of big moments. But it you can't have those big moments without these small moments. And it's ultimately the small moments that are gonna dismantle the system. Um and I'm glad that we got a lot more glimpses of them in this episode. And hopefully it's a reminder to June that sometimes a lot of it is sewing bits of arsenic into clothing um, and playing the long game. And that if she wants to see a world where Gilead ends and she gets Hannah back, it's not, she can't go in guns a blazing. Because look at what happened. She, she murdered Fred Waterford and look at all the damage it did to Gilead. None. It's still, it's none. It's yeah. still, it's still standing and Serena's back in Canada. So like, what are we going to do? Um, but I think on that note, and with a reference to Serena, we will pause for episode, the end of episode three. Um, and we'll see what we get in episode four. I do know that it's called Dear Offred and that you have watched the teaser for it. Um, Dear Offred kind of makes my internal organs clench a little bit um with anticipation and wariness uh but we'll put a pause in that again if you want to be so kind as to join us on our patreon for five us dollars a month or seven canadian dollars a month we have several canadian patrons hello brenda and nadine and jay um we would love to have you so the link will be below in the show notes for that, and you can head over there after you're done watching this and catch our Mayday moment for episode three. Um, if you're just happy enough to hang out with us on YouTube, we'd love for you to do the youtube things, like and subscribe, comment below. We're, you know, y'all, this is the most engagement we ever get on our YouTube channel <laughs> is The Handmaid's Tale. So I know the comments will be coming, and I'll be looking for them. And if you've got any specific ones for Dr. Kristen, shout her out. Um, and I'll tell her to jump in to the comments and we will see y'all, uh, either on the Patreon or for episode four. See you guys wherever. Bye.